All right, uh, welcome to the final session of Nanog 65. We'll have a few different presentations. First, uh, Ari Fogel will present on network validation. Then we'll have uh, Clinton Work from TELUS talking about IPv6 deployment experiences. And then we'll have a closing presentation uh, by Betty Burke, the executive director. So, Ari. Thanks. Hi, I'm Ari Fogel. I'm going to be presenting to you Proactive Network Configuration Validation with Batfish. This is joint work with Stanley and Todd from UCLA, Lewis and Ramesh from USC, and Meg Ratul and G2 from Microsoft Research. So as many of you are probably aware, misconfigurations in enterprise networks are somewhat common, and uh, when they, in the case that they cause outages, they can be very, very expensive. But why do these misconfigurations happen typically? Well, one of the main problems is that you have to when you're running configurations, you have to specify a number of low-level directives for multiple different routing protocols. And then you also have to model the interactions between all these different routing protocols for mechanisms like route redistribution, administrative distance, uh, BGP re-advertisement uh, with uh, policy changes, and, and so on. So even if you get that configuration right for a single node, uh, you also have to consider the sort of holistic uh, way that all the different nodes uh, communicate with each other. And it's really easy to get that wrong as well. So for example, we have this network in the center here. And on the top right, you see there's this 10 triple O network. And we have a simple intent that we want to uh, implement for this. We want 10 triple O to be reachable from the customer C on the left, uh, excuse me, from the customer here. And we want it to be unreachable from the rest of the network that's not involved in the path uh, to 10 triple O. And I've implemented this um, using these uh, configuration snippets that you see at the bottom here. So in order to make 10 triple O reachable from C, you could see lines three and four on the left for the configuration of N2 here. What we do is basically this is a directly connected network um, for N2. And for whatever reason, the operators decided to redistribute this uh, connected network into OSPF with the metric that you see here. And that's uh, to provide connectivity to 10 triple O. To make it unreachable from everywhere else, on N3, the operator in lines 4 and 5 has installed uh, a static route that just drops all traffic for 10 triple O and redistributes that static route uh, on line 5 so that the, its neighbors uh, will basically send traffic there to be dropped. Now, if you're looking at this, you may uh, notice that there's a problem here. I wonder if you can figure out what might go wrong. Well, if you actually were to run this, you would start to notice that some of the traffic uh, that reaches N1 that's destined for the 10 triple O network will go in the direction of N2 and then to N10 and then reach its destination. But some of it will go to N3 and be dropped. And this is because of equal cost multipath routing, which is initiated because these two routes have been redistributed with the same metric and they both arrive at N1. Uh, this problem where you see that a packet can be delivered or not delivered, um, non-deterministically based on, you know, some hash, uh, we call it multipath inconsistency. So in order to find problems like this, we've developed a tool called Batfish, which is a proactive configuration safety checker. It's uh, available online. You can take a look uh, after this talk if you wish. And we've used it to find real bugs in real networks. And our favorite quote uh, from one of the operators of the networks that we analyze is that with respect to the prefix that was dual assigned from yesterday, one of my knock guys stopped by today to ask what Voodoo I was using to find such things. So that was pretty fun. So the way Batfish works is that you input your router configuration files and maybe some e information about external BGP advertisements that you want to model, as well as your topology. And you also provide some assertions that you want to check and then outcome violations. And Batfish is divided into these four stages that you see here. Uh, first, we just process the configurations, then you analyze them with uh, assertions based just for the unconfigurations. And then we are actually able to use all this information to generate the forwarding tables that would occur if uh, you were actually to run this network. Uh, and then furthermore, you can write assertions about the forwarding tables that you'd like to check. So stage one is, uh, is pretty basic. We parse the configurations. So a line like this first one you see here um, on N3 would be converted to this fact about OSPF interface costs in, in our model. Uh, so you see the node is N3, the interface is N3.1, which you see from here, and the cost is 1, which uh, you get here. And we get similar information about the topology and convert that to facts that we're able to handle. 
in stage two, um, we uh, basically try to figure out all the different um, simple problems that might arise uh, during initial check of the configurations. For instance, if there are any syntax errors, that'll be reported. Uh, or common problems like uh, having an undefined reference, let's say to a route map that doesn't exist, uh, would be reported here. And on top of that, we also have a language that we've designed uh, for asking queries about the configurations. Um, and some of, and we've also provided a library of common checks that you may want to use. So for instance, you might want to uh, find out if IP addresses are reused across uh, the routers in your network. So you would input that assertion. Uh, and an example output you might get is that this, you know, this particular IP address that you see here is assigned to these two interfaces on, on these two routers. Uh, and you may want to deal with that. Uh, another common uh, thing that uh, operators wanted to see was uh, whether loopback networks were exported into OSPF. You would need this, for instance, if you wanted to run uh, MPLS or IBGP on top of your um, IGP network. And so some simple app out right here would just show you that, uh, well, actually, loopback zero, you know, on this particular router is not running active or passive OSPF, so the network's not going to uh, make it into uh, the OSPF rib. And of course, you can design your own queries as well, and, and I'll talk about that later. So after you process the configurations and now you have a model um, to, to handle all of them, we also uh, are now able to generate the forwarding tables. So we start with some basic facts from the configurations, like the fact that, let's say, um, a particular network may be exported into OSPF. And uh, using all of these facts together, we're able to compute the actual ribs that should result uh, if the routers are working properly according to uh, the spec. So for instance, that network uh, being exported from N2 may make it onto N1 uh, with such and such cost. And from there, we're also able to figure out you know, what interface um, everything will go out. So we have the, the forwarding tables as the, the final output of that step. Then in stage four, we can actually ask questions now about the forwarding table. So um, if you recall earlier, there was a multipath consistency violation in the example network. And if you were to ask uh, about multipath consistency, uh, whether it holds, then uh, you'll either get the answer, yes, it does, or you'll get uh, a violation uh, that's uh, specified in terms of a packet that would actually violate multipath consistency. So in this case, if you were to create a packet and insert it at N1 over here uh, and give it these parameters, then it would be a violation because uh, According to the routes I showed you before, some of it would go to N10 and, and be uh, accepted, and some of it would go to N3 would be, and would be dropped. Furthermore, when we find these example packets, we are also able to give you a virtual trace route um, to show you what, what is actually happening. So for that example packet in the previous slide, you see that um, on one path that it could take, it'll go from N1 to N2, then from N2 to N10 and be accepted. Uh, and on another path it could take because of ECMP, it could start at N1 and go to N3, where it's promptly dropped because of the static uh, route that is discarding packets for that network. So Batfish has been a, quite an undertaking. It's written in several programming languages, namely Java um, for most of the logic, Antler uh, for the parsing, and Datalog for the forwarding table generation. Uh, and we also support um, many different uh, routing languages. We support, support uh, Cisco IOS, NXOS, Juniper, Arista, Quanta, and, and other similar um, router uh, configuration languages. We support a wide variety of features, including route redistribution, internal, external, OSPF, BGP, communities, route maps, policy statements, et cetera. And again, this is a real tool. If you want to check it out to see whether um, it'll support your network, you can go to batfish.org and shoot me a line, and I can help you out with that. So um, we actually tested out Batfish on um, two large university networks, as well as Microsoft's network. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to tell you anything about the results at Microsoft, but I can explain what happened at these university networks. So uh, they're qualitatively different, these two. The first one uh, has a decentralized design at the core. Um, well, this is managed by the Network Operations uh, Center team. And then they have a different team for each department, uh, which is uh, configured as a different autonomous system. And, the core peers with all of these departments using BGP. In the other university network we analyzed, it's much more centralized. It's all one autonomous system, and the different departments are, are partitioned uh, by VLANs. Um, sorry. So uh, in addition to, sorry, on these uh, two networks, we tested a variety of forwarding plane properties, uh, two of which I'll, I'll discuss. The first one was uh, multipath consistency, which I've shown you earlier. 
And the second one is a check about fault tolerance. So we want to see whether reachability will be impacted uh, by the failure of any single link in the network. So if you look at this network below, on the left there's a customer that is advertising two routes, uh, 2.2.2.0 and, and 3030. Uh, and on the right, this network has route maps that will accept uh, the triple two o network at N2 and will accept advertisements for both networks at N1. So if you were to actually turn off this link, then you would see triple three o is no longer reachable because there's nobody uh, to accept advertisements for it anymore. So this would be a violation of the, this fault tolerance property that we want to check. So um, as I said, we, we tested these properties on these two networks. Uh, in this column, you can see the total number of violations that were detected initially by our tool. Uh, in this column, we show the violations that were confirmed to be real problems by the operators. Uh, for multipath, they were all confirmed to be problems. And for fault tolerance, uh, we had some false positives simply because uh, the way the network was organized, uh, some uh, of the departments actually had different names, but were really the same department. So it appeared that there was no fault tolerance, but there really was. Uh, for net two, again, all the multipath violations were confirmed to be real. And uh, because we had incomplete topology information about the way the VLANs were set up, uh, there were some false positives in uh, detection of fault tolerance, because we would have maybe multiple um, interfaces underlying a VLAN. So really, no loss of a single interface would have been able to uh, cause a loss of connectivity. Of these uh, violations, uh, the majority of them were fixed. Um, in uh, the case for net one, uh, the multipath violations were not fixed uh, immediately because uh, a discussion needed to be had about uh, the um, peering situation between the core and a uh, particular department where this violation occurred. Uh, and I haven't yet heard uh, news back about uh, what they ended up doing. Um, in the fault tolerance case for both networks, uh, none of them were fixed because to actually fix it required um, laying down new lines, and that was not something that they were ready to do just at that moment. But all the multipath violations for Net2 were, in fact, fixed. So I'm going to do uh, a quick demo for you with a network that I designed that is a sort of analog of uh, Network1. I've written Cisco configuration files for this example network and planted some bugs in there. So let's take a look. So um, basically, uh, what we've done is we've, we've zipped up the configuration files and, and, uh, that I've written for this network and uploaded them. And now what we're going to do is process them. Uh, you can't see here, but down here, um, it's uh, parsing and uh, converting that to our unified format that we use to represent configurations. That's done. And now we're going to generate the forwarding tables uh, for that network. Now, in addition to be able to check in forwarding properties on a single network, we can also look at um, forwarding properties related to the difference between two uh, potential versions of a network. So once this is done, we're also going to generate another data plane, which is, excuse me, another a set of forwarding tables, which is uh, going to be representative of the same network, but with one configuration file modified. And then after that, we're going to try to see um, what the difference is uh, in reachability between those two versions of the network. So the first one is done. Now let's do the second one. And while that's running, let me just uh, show you some of the configuration files to, so you get an idea of what this all looks like. Oh, I'm sorry. One, one moment. <laughs> all right, so here's the network that we're actually analyzing. Um, there is a, a tier of border routers, which uh, is connected to a tier of core routers that serve as route reflectors, uh, which are connected to the distribution layer. And this distribution layer appears uh, with individual academic departments. So in this example, there's just one department and one host behind it. And also, there's two um, upstream ISPs uh, that are uh, separate autonomous systems that this network peers with. So let's go back and see if this is done. It appears that it is. So let's take a look at um, what has actually happened so far. So right now, we're checking for parse errors. And if you look on the right, you see that there are none. So let's move on uh, to another simple checklist. Oh, boy. Excuse me one moment. Sorry, this uh, UI is very fragile. If you type something in the box, <laughs> it becomes very hard to show anything there. Excuse me one second. 
should be able to pick up where I left off. Um, anyway, that's all, all been processed, and now we can move on to analyzing the, um, uh, the forwarding planes. So let's pick a question to ask. So for this network, you may want to know whether uh, IPs are um, reused uh, on different interfaces. So we can ask this question and see the result. Um, so if you take a look here, what it's saying is that on AS2 border 2, which is one of the border routers I showed you, interface loopback 0, there is an IP assignment of 2112. And that same IP, IP is also assigned to AS2 host 1, loopback 0, which is uh, the host at the very top of the picture I showed you earlier over here. We may also want to check to see whether um, OSPF uh, contains all of the uh, loopback networks. So let's check for that. So it detected two violations here. The uh, internal autonomous system at the top, AS2 Dept 1 and AS2 Host 1, are not actually um, exporting loopback 0 into OSPF. So those violations were detected. And uh, we can also check actual you know, forwarding properties. So the first one we're going to check is, oh, I'm sorry, one moment. Uh, one second. Yeah, okay. I entered the wrong text. I just need to start that over. So what this is basically doing is trying to discover um, all the packets that might violate uh, multipath consistency, and then afterwards it, it figures out what would happen to those packets for some samples that it uh, gives us. So it's um, usually quicker. Oh, there we go. So the output we, is shown on the right here. Oh, boy. I'll just uh, pick um, one particular packet that it found. So it says that if you insert at AS2 department 1, which is um, the second one from the top in the picture here, a packet with a destination IP of 3022, which would be destined for that um, ISP on the right, um, in the bottom of the picture. And if the destination port on that packet is Telnet, then these are the four different paths that that uh, packet could take. And the first path. You see it starts at AS2 department 1, goes through uh, this set of routers and interfaces, eventually reaches its destination at AS3 core 1, and is accepted. However, if it takes a slightly different path, uh, which exists because of ECMP, then it will go and be dropped at AS2 core 1 because of the inbound ACL, whose name is block telnet, line 0, which is the first line of that ACL. So now we can actually take a look at AS2 core 1. And in fact, there is an ACL there called block telnet. And this line just simply blocks telnet. So that's confirmed. Um, so now for the other property, let me just get it started. And I'll discuss it. Um, so while that's running, there on this AS2 Dept 1 router here, there is an ACL, which I will show you in a second. Um, on Fast Ethernet 1.0, which is the one pointing up towards uh, the host, there is an ACL called Restrict Host Traffic In, which is supposed to only allow traffic from, you know, above in the incoming direction. But the operator sees this and thinks, well, how come we're not also restricting traffic in the other direction? And in fact, there is an ACL defined to do just that in this file uh, here, restrict host traffic out. So to fix this, the operator makes an assignment um, of that ACL in the outgoing direction on that interface. And let's see what happens. So what we see on the right here now, excuse 
me. Is that there's in the original scenario with the uh, configs that are unmodified, there's a packet that could be sent from AS1 border 1, which is the, uh, from the ISP on the left, um, with the destination IP shown here. That destination IP is for the host at the very top. And in the original scenario, that packet will be accepted uh, no matter which of the uh, equal cost paths that it takes. Now, in the second scenario where we've modified one of the configuration files, we see that in each situation, it gets to AS2 department 1 and then is dropped because of an ACL called re restrict host traffic in line 1 of that ACL. So the problem here is that the operator actually had a typo when they assigned this ACL, which uh, is perfectly feasible in practice. Instead of assigning the outgoing ACL, they assign the incoming one. And so now what happens is all traffic to, that, uh, to any host in that department ends up getting dropped. So that concludes the demo. Um, and the presentation. <laughs> so we have a um, survey that we would like you all to take if you operate networks because we want to add feature support uh, for net that people actually use. So please go online and take it. It should only take about 10, 15 minutes. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me at uh, arifogel at ucla.edu. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for questions in the room, and we have questions in the room. Good morning, Matt Pitak, Yahoo. So I, I saw like cool IPv4 addresses. Does this grok IPv6? I'm, I'm sorry, because of the echo. Because of the does, echo, it's, does this uh, the question is, um, do you, does it support v6? Um, we have parsing support, but because none of the networks that we analyzed used it in any real capacity, it's not supported yet, but that I'm sure. In fact, we've talked to several operators here already that have asked that very same question, so that'll be uh, the top priority uh, for features. Yes, addition. thank you. So, just a quick follow-up. So neither Microsoft nor UCLA are using IPv6? What's that? Uh, I think the question was... I mean, I'm pretty sure they are, aren't they? I think the question was... Uh, Sorry, Michael Sinatra, UCLA just floated that bomb. UCLA does not support v6, question mark, or... or how do you know I analyzed UCLA? <laughs> well, I did. Uh, that, I can't tell you anything about that. That, that, uh, that network that you displayed looked an awful lot like UCLA's network. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> any, right, any resemblance to uh, characters and networks, living or dead? Purely coincidental. Hi. Uh, do you have any plans to support uh, XR and uh, ISIS? Um, yeah, actually, we just added parsing support for XR um, a couple months back. Um, so th there is some basic stuff. Generally, whenever we um, look at a new network, we, we have to update the parser just because of the way um, different constructs are used uh, and people use different features. But yeah, the basic support is there, I believe. For uh, ISS as well? You said for XR? A but he also XR said I and ISI. IS right, ISIS as opposed to exclusively OSPF. Oh, ISIS. Yeah, there is support for ISIS. Cool. Thanks. So it's a, it's a little boomy up here with um, when things come in from the audience. So yeah, it's, it's, patience is appreciated. It's not synchronized, so I just hear everything like. Um, Any other questions? OK, then. Thanks very much, Ari.